everybody. Welcome back to English 112. This is for our class for Tuesday, the 30th of November. And I'm hopeful you had a good holiday weekend. You'll notice that on today's syllabus, it says catch up class, which is exactly what I'm planning on doing, talking about a raisin in the sun. And then eventually we will be transitioning over to our last unit, which happens to be poetry. The good news is, is that we've dabbled in poetry in the drama section, so it won't be something that's completely new. And journal number two for drama, I've given it a small extension for that because we ended up using a little bit more time. So that will be due on Thursday, the 2nd of December, 11.59 p.m. And the journals will be very similar to the journals you did with Short Story, except this time I'm asking that you write about a page or so in response to Oedipus the King, and then another page or so in response to A Midsummer, and then lastly, a page or so in response to A Raisin in the Sun. Of course, you can always write more, but a page should give you at least an opportunity to begin to examine some of the ideas and the dramas. And as you know, you will be writing another paper. It'll be very similar to the paper you wrote about short story, but this time it's going to be about drama. So I'm hopeful that perhaps the journals will give you some ideas or directions for the paper. I've given suggested paper topics, and you can find that in the syllabus and other documents folder. But as well, you can create your own, though I encourage you to touch base with me if you decide to do that. And paper number two, I'm also going to give a slight extension to, and this will be the 16th of December, and this is the very last day of class before we transition over to our final exam. The final exam is mostly going to be devoted to poetry, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the final as we get into the poetry section, but basically the final is going to be an essay exam where you are going to be responding to two out of a handful of so poems that we would have um, discussed in class. You just don't know which poems I'm going to be selecting as options for you. So the best way to study for the final is to watch all of the videos and do all of the reading is basically then you can synthesize what we've been talking about in terms of poetry and of course add additional thoughts or ideas and normally we would take that final exam in class um, but obviously since we're online we'll be doing it online I'll give you 24 hours to do that particular exam and I'm not expecting the kind of quality or depth of what would happen with the paper where you have multiple um, days, sometimes weeks, to be able to work on an assignment. But you still, you still should be able to put together some of the ideas that we will have been discussing in terms of poetry. But before we get to poetry, I wanted to talk a little bit about a raisin in the sun. And I had suggested that you really wanted to think about names. For instance, and you can see this in the notes below, Mama. It's no mistake that her first name is Lena. In other words, People lean on her for love and support, shelter, utilities, food, tuition, hobbies, you name it. Um, and she, just like all of the characters in the play, have a certain level of complexity to them. So they aren't completely good. They aren't completely flawed. There's some place in between, which is what I think makes this play so appealing because there's so much realism. And she certainly is strong and loving, but she also can be domineering as we see early on in the play, um, when she and Ruth are talking about ways in which Travis uh, should be cared for. Think about the complexities involved in that relationship, living with one's mother-in-law. And obviously, since it's Lena's home, she has say over how things are, are done. But Travis is not Lena's son, it's Ruth's son. So again, think about the complexity that would be involved there. We also see Mama's domineering nature with her own daughter, for instance, Benita, when it comes to religion. And again, you can say that it's Mama's house and it's Mama's rules. But of course, Mama represents a very different generation than the generation of Benita, which is another way of viewing this play. Certainly, the play is about race, but we can also view this play in terms of, rent, of gender and in terms of age. Um, many of the isms that we oftentimes talk about, things like racism, sexism, ageism, classism, and all of those are embedded within the play. Plus, if for no other reason, the play is about dreams, and I think that's something that's universal, that we all share dreams, and what happens when those dreams are not fulfilled. Keep in mind that Mama's last name and the surname for the entire family is Younger, 
And we talked about this with Young Goodman Brown, that Young has lots of positive associations with it, um, kind of new ideas and new thoughts and experimentation, but it also has negatives associated with it. So for instance, the idea of being naive or not experienced, and both apply to this family. And when we think about her son, Walter Lee Jr., notice that he's a junior. He's named after his father. In other words, he's living in the shadow of his father. And there's definitely commentary to that effect about when will Walter live up to the kind of reputation that his father had or be the man that he was. Keep the nicknames in mind as well as the actual names because Walter is called Prometheus at one point. And Prometheus is from Greek mythology. Prometheus stole fire from the gods to give to humanity and was punished accordingly. And one could say that Walter is doing very similar things when he steals the insurance money because of his hubris and arrogance, thinking that he's right and everybody else is wrong. And of course, the negative consequences that he suffers from that. And we do know that Walter's very full of himself. He's very proud and arrogant and selfish. And he also um, is oftentimes inebriated. One of the reasons why Mama doesn't want him to have a liquor store. And the liquor store in some ways represents the American dream of business ownership. And if you think about the American dream, we talked a little bit about this when we were talking about Invisible Man. It's basically home ownership which is a major element in this play. Uh, business ownership, which again is something that Walter wants to pursue. Um, education for one's children. And this is something that gives us a different sense of Walter in that there's a, a scene in the play where he talks about his motivations for wanting to do what he's doing. And part of it is so that Travis can have educational opportunities. So even though Walter presents a whole host of negatives in terms of his ambition and his selfishness and his drinking, he also presents us with positives in terms of his, his true desire to do uh, better for his family and um, his true desire to basically show his family that he loves them. He's just going about it in not necessarily the best of ways. Um, Ruth Younger, now, if you think about Ruth, this is a biblical name. And in the Bible, Ruth was this long-suffering daughter-in-law. And you can get the sense that definitely Ruth is living up to her name in this particular play. She's the long-suffering daughter-in-law. Torn between Walter and Mama and trying to negotiate between the two. And at one point, things seem so desperate for Ruth. Um, she has an unplanned pregnancy and her first thought is to abort the child. And this is so significant, firstly, because this is a very religious household. But secondly, because at the time period of this play, religion is illegal. So what she is contemplating is something that's very dangerous, very unsafe, and very illegal. That shows her desperation because they just frankly don't have the space for another human being. They don't have the resources for another mouth. Travis Younger, I think is quite interesting, and that, that happens to be Walter and Ruth's child. Notice that Travis Younger is not named Walter the way his father and his grandfather were. In other words, he might represent moving away from the past generations into something new. And I think that's illustrated with him wanting to have his own work ethic. He wants to carry groceries on his own. And he also buys Mama his own gift rather than um, um, chipping in with everybody else. The, the carrying the groceries, we can see that as a, pos as a positive and that he wants to contribute to the family and be responsible. But it also can be seen as a kind of negative that he's so young and yet so concerned with money. In some ways, we might say these are the lessons that he's learning from his father. And then Benita Younger, and it's not too much of a stretch to see that her name Benita is about being beneath and the idea that she would be viewed as beneath others because of her age, she's younger, her gender, she's a female, and her race, she's black. And despite all of that, she's a college student who aspires to go and become a doctor in a time period when this would be very unusual. So that said, we might argue that 
beneath her doesn't necessarily see herself as beneath others, and perhaps she sees others as beneath her who are not pursuing education. Again, there's a complexity to her character that as much as we admire Benita for her ambition, we also see some of the negative qualities that she possesses. Um, she's dating two men. One, she freely admits that she's not very interested in, uh, George Murchison, though you could say that's part of her youth, the idea of experimentation. Think about her hobbies, and not only does she flit from hobby to hobby, these are very expensive hobbies. Um, horseback riding in particular, note this family lives in Chicago, so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to be pursuing horseback riding if you live in the city. Um, but even something like photography or guitar playing, it requires equipment. And there's never any mention beneath the having a job. We assume that her education and her hobbies are being financed by the family. And in fact, Walter at one point even says so, that Travis has gone without new shoes to help Benita in her pursuits. Now, Benita, too, has a nickname. She's known as Benny, and that is a, a very male-centric name, Benny. And think about the idea of how, in many ways, she's pursuing many male elements in a society that would view those as for male and not female. Being a doctor, um, not getting married, uh, being independent. Um, at one point, Walter tells her, why can't you just be a nurse like other women? Um, and... Another nickname that she has is Elio, and she's given that by one of her other boyfriends, um, and that's Georgia Saga. And Elio means one for whom bread or food is not enough, and I think that characterizes her very well, and that she continually aspires for more, which can be both positive, but also can be negative. Remember how we talked about this with the sorrowful woman, that we could, um, we, we could empathize with her needs for more. However, we also understand that she has responsibilities to others. It's not just herself because she has a family. And how do you balance those two? So again, very realistic with an element of complexity there. Um, she's very much uh, resistant to assimilation. She very much wants to embrace her cultural identity, so much to the point that she looks down on other members of the family who don't, in her opinion, embrace their cultural identity. And I think that this strong female, Benita, it, in some ways could represent uh, Lorraine Hansberry herself in a very male-centric sort of occupation, playwriting at this particular point. The boyfriend that she has that she's not too terribly interested in, George Merchantson, he has money. It's one of the reasons why she's dating him. Again, you can say perhaps that's a bit shallow. Um, also, his name, Merchantson. George is the son of a merchant, a dry cleaning business, actually, that's become quite successful. And the first name, George, you think about the United States and our first president, George Washington. So you put these two together, you can see that this name is very much an assimilationist name. Um, very much in contrast to Benita's other boyfriend, Joseph Asagai, where Joseph can be seen to be an assimilationist name, but not Asagai. That's definitely an African name. And we see that Joseph Asagai is able to merge those two worlds. It's, it's something that Benita is trying to struggle with, uh, the mixture of the American and the African. And he encourages Benita to pursue her cultural identity um, in a way that George Murchison doesn't. And he also, he believes in education, particularly for um, not just uh, the poor in the United States, but more importantly, for the poor in his country of origin, Africa. We are introduced to a Mr. Littner from the ironically named Welcoming Committee. Um, supposedly, this is the neighborhood association that is um, trying to welcome, quote unquote, the youngers, because as we know, the plot is that the youngers have gotten a $10,000 insurance policy and mama has taken a big chunk of it to buy a home, to put a down payment on in a home. And the home just happens to be in an all Caucasian neighborhood. Keep in mind that this was the time of segregation. So there's going to be a good amount of pushback. It's legal for her to move in there, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't social anger and uprising about it. 
And we see that with Mr. Lindner. Notice he has the title of Mr. of Respect when he comes to the household to try to convince them that, well, it would be better if they didn't move in. They would be happier. And the neighborhood has gathered together money so that they could basically buy them out of the house. And of course, initially, the response is no, that we earned this house and we have every right to it. After Walter takes the rest of the money that Mama entrusts him to and, and basically squanders it in a bad business deal, that's the point where Walter thinks about accepting Littner's offer. Where I've had many, many readers and students say, well, maybe he should have accepted Littner's offer because he would have come out ahead financially. He could have bought another home. But at what cost? If you think about the how he would have lost his self-respect and his pride and his honor, which is something that Walter comes to by the ending of the play. Um, though I suppose if he were really a savvy businessman, he would take the money that Lindner would give him and yet buy another home in Clybourne Park and just continue over and over again until he actually owned all of Clybourne Park. Um, I think that's what the robber barons did in, in many respects when we think about American history. But again, the the play, which has its low moments, but also has its high moments, one of its highest moments is Walter's transformation at the end and the ability of the family to unite as one. Because keep in mind, that as, as distraught as they all are that the money has been lost, they haven't lost the money for the down payment of the house. They've lost the money that would have gone for Walter's liquor store and the money that would have gone to Benita's education. But they still should be able to afford the house itself, especially because the way real estate was at the time, that it was oftentimes more expensive to rent than it was to buy. And in fact, in some respects, it's still similar today. Now, one character that usually is omitted from the play, or at least performances of the play, because of length, this is a long play, and also because of cost, because you've got to think about hiring something like an actor and understudying wardrobe and so forth, is Mrs. Wilhelmina Othella Johnson. And this name is a mouthful. This is the nosy neighbor. And basically, she's supposed to be a friend and a community member of the Youngers, but she doesn't much act like it. She seems to take a, a certain level of delight that the Youngers are going to be experiencing difficulties when they move into an all-Caucasian neighborhood. And her name gives us a sense of that. Othella is a play on the, uh, on the name Othello, which happens to be a drama by Shakespeare, which happens to be about a Moor, a black man, who basically marries a white woman, and the consequences, the discrimination and the racism that results because of it. I don't want to give away too many spoilers. And of course, the person who wrote Othello is Will Shakespeare. Notice that the nosy neighbor's name is Wilhelmina, Shakespeare. So this is Hansberry's wink and a nod that she's referencing Will, William Shakespeare, and his play Othello, and that racism and discrimination still exists, not just from others, but within one's own community, which goes to show the many challenges that the youngers face, not just from welcoming committees, but from their own neighbors. Um, and if you think about the name Johnson, that's also a very common name. And we talked a little bit about this with young Goodman Brown, too. The suggestion is that perhaps Mrs. Uh, Wilhelmina Johnson is not the only one who would act this way of members of her own community advancing themselves. Or if we think about something like Invisible Man, when all of the boxers were put into the boxing ring, basically to fight each other rather than to fight the true enemy. Perhaps this makes us more sense. Now, um... Bobo is one of the business partners that um, that uh, Walter has. And, and might I suggest you don't need to be an economics major to figure out that maybe it's not such a great idea to be giving money to a Bobo, which is basically an idiot, a kind of clown-like figure. That's what that means. And Willie, the one who runs away with the uh, money, um, Willie is a slang term for penis. And one might say that he's a real you-know-what for stealing the money. So again, Hansberry, very, very careful with the names that she's choosing. One character that oftentimes is ignored or forgotten as a character that I wanted to draw your attention to is the plant. Because people usually think of characters in terms of human beings. But I would say that plant is central to this play. The plant needs to be cast correctly. It needs to look like it barely is surviving. So it can illustrate the plight of the family, which is barely surviving. Basically just being kept alive by love and, and mama's nurturing. And then you could say the same for the family. And much like the family, the, 
the plant is crowded. It doesn't have a place to spread its roots or in other words, to um, spread out. And think about how we use the word roots to reference family as well as a plant's roots, for instance. And then the actual title, which comes from um, a, a poem, A Dream Deferred um, is the first line, and it happens to be a poem called Harlem by Langston Hughes. But think about a raisin. A raisin is a dried grape. Um, basically, this dried fruit imagery that a raisin is tasty, but a raisin in the sun becomes inedible because it's lost all of its moisture, all of its life force. Um, and that, that could be basically be what's happening to this family as their dreams become unrealized they're drying out much like that raisin in the sun think of the color imagery as well raisins tend to be dark and the sun tends to be light and again that could also reference african americans and caucasians but think about the slang as well raisin for raising and this entire play is about raising either family members who are trying to raise their station so that they're in a better position or the idea of raising sons in particular. That's another play off of the word son. It doesn't have to be S-U-N. It could be S-O-N. Mama, in many ways, is still trying to raise Walter. And Walter is trying to raise Travis. So... All of these, I, I think, work really well in trying to understand some of the major themes in the, in the drama. Um, the play begins with that poem that I wanted to read to you, What Happens to a Dream Deferred, because it really does set the stage, so to speak, of the major themes that we're going to be encountering in the play. And this particular play, I think, gives us a sense of the universal nature of humanity, um, regardless of one station in life. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? And think about how applicable that poem is to what's happening to these family members as they are drying up like a raisin in the sun because of the lack of hope and opportunity. Or festering like a sore, this idea of disease. And at one point, Walter is talking about how he feels like he's all eaten up by his ambition. Or does it stink like rotten meat? Again, the idea of something spoiling. Or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet. I, I can't help but think of someone like a Mrs. Johnson who pretends to care but really doesn't. Or it sags like under a heavy load. And at one point, Ruth even says that she's willing to, if they can move, have her baby and strap it to her back and, and clean all of the kitchens in Chicago if necessary. We definitely get the sense that she is sagging under a heavy load. Or does it explode? And we definitely see that with Walter. He always seems to be on the edge. At one point, he even references himself as a kind of volcano that, that's about to erupt in one way or another. So that poem not only supplies the title, but I think it also gives us a sense of the themes we're going to find. And, of course, Mama wants more than anything, her dream, to have a home, not because necessarily she wants equity, but because she wants a place for her family to grow and be safe. And she also wants sunshine and a garden. In other words, she wants to nurture life. And in her mind, this is the best way to use the money because they can all benefit from it. Walter wants wealth. And the idea of being a business owner, uh, in his mind, would mean that he could be the family caretaker. And again, there are negatives to this, but also positives. Ruth also is very much like Mama, a younger version, wanting a home for her growing family and privacy. Again, can you imagine how difficult it must be to live in an apartment with your mother-in-law in these closed-in spaces? Beneath the, for her, it's the answer is education and having a career and identity. Again, in a time period where this would be very unusual for a woman, more unusual for a black woman, and even more unusual for a poor black woman. So she's got three basically major obstacles against her. Even Travis, you might say, you know, his desire to carry groceries shows a certain dream or ambition to improve himself. 
But one of the things that I, I've always admired about Lorraine Hansberry is how literary this text is, even in places where it doesn't need to be literary. Take something like stage directions. As we talked about, if we're reading a play, though of course we've watched versions of all three of these plays, but if we're reading a play, we need to pay particular attention to the stage directions because this is basically the author's vision of how they're visualizing it on stage. And if you did watch the uh, Sidney Poitier version of A Raisin in the Sun, you'll see that it is very similar to the text that Hansberry wrote, in part because she worked on the screenplay. So this is her adaptation to screen. And obviously, you can take liberties when you're on screen. We have outdoor scenes in the movie that we would never have in the actual play because you can't put an outdoor scene on the stage realistically. Um, but that said, it still follows fairly closely. If you were reading, or I, said, I should say, if, if you were watching the play, then you wouldn't have any kind of connection with the stage directions. But listen to these stage directions in Act 1 if we were reading the play, and we should have finished by now. The younger living room would be a comfortable and well-ordered room, if not for a number of indestructible contradictions to the state of being. And might I suggest this entire play is about contradictions. Its furnishings are typical and undistinguished. Their primary feature now is that they've clearly had to accommodate the living of too many people for too many years, and they are tired. Notice the personification to the furniture that that's basically used as an illustration of the family. Again, something that we would not have been exposed to in watching the play on stage, but I think Lorraine Hansberry was very well aware that there would be individuals who would be experiencing her play in print. And she paid as much attention to those details as she did to the actual dialogue. And minor details can mean so much. So early on in the play, when basically Ruth is asking Walter, what kind of eggs do you want? He says, not scrambled. She scrambles his eggs, which already shows that there's tension between them, this kind of passive aggressiveness between them. And one could say that Walter, too, is all scrambled up in terms of his ideas and his thoughts. Um, there are references to things that we don't necessarily get in the actual uh, version that, that we saw on stage. There's a, At one point, there's a reference to rats, that Travis is outdoors playing with rats, um, and the family is horrified with that. Again, think about the American dream, where you should have a white picket fence and basically a yard where you're playing with your puppy or your kitten, certainly not with a rat, which goes to show how dire things are. And the references to, let's say, um, the dreams, while there are wonderful quotes about those, I wanted to talk a little bit about a quote about love on page 145, which perhaps is my favorite quote. And then we can go back to some of the other quotes. This is at the ending of the play when basically... Uh, Benita has, has given up in frustration with her brother after having lost the money, and now he's willing to basically degrade himself with Lidner. And Benita says to Mama, and for me, this is on page 145, love him, there's nothing left to love. And, and this is Mama's response. There's always something left to love. And if you ain't learned that, you ain't learned nothing. Have you cried for that boy today? I don't mean for yourself and for the family because we lost the money. I mean for him. And what he's been through, what it done to him. Child, when do you think is the time to love somebody the most? When they done good and made things easy for everybody? Well then, that ain't that ain't through learning because that ain't the same, that ain't the time at all. It's when he's at his lowest and can't believe in himself because the world done whipped him so. When you start measuring somebody, measure him right, child, measure him right. Make sure you're done taking into account what hills and valleys he come through before he got to wherever he is. And I always love that quote. Something that I wanted to leave you with in this class. The time to love somebody is not when it's easy, but when it's difficult. I think our society could benefit from that. Notice how different Mama's language is from Benita's, where Benita is speaking formal academic English, um, as opposed to Mama and Walter, where they're speaking a much more informal colloquial language, which would be suitable for their particular characters. And you can see in the notes below that I have quite a few uh, quotes 
that I wanted to review with you about things like sexism and the meaning of money. Uh, the episode with the uh, white shoes that uh, basically Murchison um, is confronted by Walter and Walter is disgusted with his white shoes. Um, Murchison's response about the purpose of school the Mrs. Johnson episode, of course, and a quote that the two things the family has to fear are people are, are is the Ku Klux Klan and people like Mrs. Johnson. They're, so they're put on equal grounds. Walter's dreams. Um, the fear um, at, at one point, the question is, what what are they so afraid of in, in Clybourne Park that we're going to eat them? And the response is, no, marry them. And I think that's such an incredibly important quote in terms of understanding the fears and the anxieties of this particular neighborhood and some of the fears and anxieties associated with racism and classism and sexism and all of the other isms in our society. Um, the plan and the way that it expresses mama, Benita's dreams, Asagai's dreams, and also that incredible transformation at the ending of the play that we see with Walter. And then the very final element where mama takes the plant with her. She almost forgets it, but she takes it. It's very important that she does because of the significance of the plant. So I thought that those are the things I would talk about next class. And then we would transition over to our poetry section, which we will begin in much the same way we've begun with George Story and Drama. What is poetry? How do we read it? How do we write it? or write about it, I should say, and then how ultimately we can evaluate a formulaic poetry that, that might have, you know, a sound element that sounds like poetry, but it doesn't really have the depth or the sophistication that we would want. And I think we talked a little bit about this when we were talking about a Midsummer Night's Dream, where Bottom and his nonsense poetry, the raging rocks and shivering shocks, raging locks, and it it, it rhymes, but it, it, it doesn't, you know, prison gates and, and fates, but it's nonsense. You know? So just because it, it has a musical quality to it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's great poetry, which we'll talk about. But as you know, we're transitioning over from our drama section into our um, finally our poetry section. So I thought that that would be a good question to ask for today's discussion form on, on Wednesday that would be due. Um, or I'm sorry. Yes, no, that's correct. So that would be due a Wednesday at 10 a.m. Um, and I thought I would ask you about which drama do you think you will write paper number two about and why? Which drama do you think you will write paper number two about and why? And of course, you don't necessarily have to be committed to that. You can you can change your mind along the way. But I wanted you to begin thinking about that second paper. So that'll be due on Wednesday, the, the 1st of December, believe it or not. We're moving into the final stretch at 10 o'clock a.m. So I hope you're all doing well. I am doing well. And we will continue on next class by putting some closure on a raisin in the sun and beginning our last unit, poetry. Take care. Bye-bye.